Hello, everyone. Thank, thank you all for coming out to our event tonight. Uh, my name is Bonnie. I'm a bookseller at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, before I introduce our authors, I just want to start off with a very heartfelt thank you to everyone who's come out virtually uh, to participate in this stream. Um, everyone at Booksmith really, really appreciates you for coming. Uh, we have been lucky enough uh, to be able to organize virtual events like this and hopefully bring a little bit of the familiar Booksmith experience to you at home. Um, so we really hope that you like it. Um, if you would like to continue to support Brookline Booksmith, uh, there should be um, a green button at the bottom of the screen. And or, oh, it's not there yet, but I'll put it there in a second. Um, and there you'll be able to purchase uh, Charlotte Pence's book and support her and, um, and Booksmith. Some quick housekeeping notes, as you can have probably seen, you can use the chat to say hello and make comments. Um, we just ask that comments are kept considerate and respectful, which I'm sure everyone was planning on being anyway. Um, we will be having a Q&A at the end. So if you'd like to ask a question, there's a little ask a question um, button at the bottom of your screen and you can ask it and we'll be able to, um, to sh share those questions with the authors at the end. Um, and now for introductions. Uh, our conversation partners today are John Scoyles and Gail Mazur. Uh, John Scoyles has written six books of poetry and five books of prose and has been teaching writing and literature for over 25 years. His most recent book is Driven, a tender travelogue that takes place over the course of 24 hours and tiptoes along the line between fiction and memoir and between our world and the next. If you're interested in checking out John's latest, I'll drop a link in the chat where you can purchase it in just a sec. Um, and now for Gail. Uh, Gail Mazur is the distinguished writer in residence at Emerson College and the founding director of the Blacksmith House Poetry Series in Cambridge. She is also the author of six collections of poetry. Her forthcoming collection is Land's End, which is out in September. Uh, it is a meditative narrative that reflects on the past and through its remembrances looks to the future. If you are interested in pre-ordering it, I will also drop a link um, in the chat in a second. And of course, uh, our author Charlotte uh, has joined us today to read from and discuss her new collection of poems, Code. Charlotte Pence is the director of Stokes Center for Creative Writing at the University of South Alabama. In addition to her latest collection, she is the author of the full-length Many Small Fires and two award-winning chapbooks, Weaves a Clear Night and The Branches, the Axe, the Missing. Pence also writes creative nonfiction, including essays that have appeared in the Harvard Review, Booth Magazine, and Zone 3. She is also the author of The Writer's Path, Creative Exercises for Meaningful Essays, and The Poetics of American Song Lyrics, an anthology which considers song lyrics through the lens of literary study. Her newest collection, Code, synthesizes science and poetry, exploring grief and loss through three voices, a new father, a mother dying young from an inherited disease, and that very mother's own DNA. So without further ado, I will hand it to our authors. Uh, welcome Charlotte, John, and Gail. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. So shall I go first? That was our plan, correct? Uh, that, that, right? That's correct. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you for having me here, Charlotte. I'm uh, happy to be part of this book launch and uh, it's an honor. And also I'm very moved by having this as a sort of memorial for Stephanie, uh, who as soon as you mentioned her name, I saw her smile, as I mentioned to you in an email, how uh, wonderful she was every time she came to the office, just brightened up the place. Uh, and that's what I always will remember about her and her work uh, was her wonderful presence, both on the page and off. Uh, I'm going to read three uh, poems, very different poems, and then Gail will follow me. Uh, I, I got Paul Muldoon's new book, uh, it came out last fall, and I was very taken with the first poem. 
because it made me smile because it was about as, uh, the first line is, the first thing I remember is being stepped on by a horse. And when I read that, I thought, what's the first thing I remember? Maybe I can write a poem in that mode. Uh, I don't write formal poems, but I did write a little poem uh, in that mode right after his. It's about the first thing I remember. His is called The Great Horse of the World, and mine is called The Great Deviled Eggs of the World. <laughs> the first thing I recall is a falling tray of deviled eggs when I opened the refrigerator door, splashing my shirt, shorts, and legs before it hit the floor, leaving my mother in her bridge club just the dregs. The uproar was so great, I can still see the runny mess that even the most imaginative hen could not anticipate. And the eggs, no longer oval with loneliness, embrace the boy about to taste the condiments of fate. Major oh. piece, major poem. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Anyway, I did send it to him, hoping he didn't think it was a parody. He said he loved it. What did you expect he was going to say? I hate it. Anyway, um, next poem is a strange one, too. As I said, I picked three different poems um, in which, toward the end of it, uh, the hand of a clock speaks. And it's called Lifespan of the Average Man. I'm waiting for a sign that says my pulse is strong. My reflex is fair, despite the years, and that making the long trip to meet her is not entirely wrong. Time will help. Time will also kill those who call life a living. Life doesn't call itself that. Life waits for you to name it, and regret claims it if you stall. The sign finally came when the minute hand fell from the face of the clock on the wall, freed from the task of keeping time, but not stopping it. The remaining hand stuttered in place, and then, having the stage to itself, it spoke, saying, it's too late to ask the past. I'm sorry how it feels. It lies at the base of the dial, a spade beside a grave. Now I live in the so-called moment, a finite part of an infinite plan. Do you call this stopped heart a model of how to live and what to do? There is no difference between day and night from my point of view. And the last one is called Friends in Dreams. And uh, this year, Gail and I lost a very close friend, Roger Skillings, who lived in Provincetown, was a writer and instrumental in the Fine Arts Work Center for decades. And uh, I don't remember dates very well, uh, but I will remember January 15th, because that night, this past January, I had a dream that Roger asked me to have a drink with him. And he hadn't been well, but he wasn't on his deathbed. But I woke up that morning and I thought, you know, I think Roger died. And, and later in the day, I got a text from a friend of mine saying Roger died last night. And uh, it's still something that uh, stayed with me. And I wrote this poem, which is not about him entirely, but inspired by him. And it's called uh, Friends in Dreams. The pond reflected the foliage, and our reflections trembled at the rim, as if showing we were souls in skin that would fall from us like these leaves this autumn. We no longer breathed between sand and sky. We were with friends in dreams. A kiss disappeared in the mist near her face my palm passed through his outstretched hand. One turned the tarot deck, another walked on his knees down the center aisle of the church of the typical inhabitant, and at the rail lit the wick of a burned down vow. I was enjoying my role in this eternal animation, 
among friends and dreams, when the best of them, pierced by a diagnosis, called from an office outside my reverie with the news and the need to leave the world of make-believe, asking that I take him home. And there he was at the waiting room window, staring into the sheer sunlit maze of streets and avenues that ended here. Thank you. Uh, now, I'm happy to introduce my colleague, friend of many decades, Gail Mazur. Gail. Thank you, John. Oh, it's wonderful. I, I didn't know you'd had that dream the night before Roger died or the night of Roger died. But it's also great to be here with Charlotte and to think about Stephanie, whom I never knew as Shira, but the lovely, lovely person that is really unforgettable, and to celebrate your new book. So I'm going to read two poems, and it was hard to decide. Partly, I have a new, my eighth book is a new and selected, and it's just, I've, I've been weeding through poems and weeding out poems so much that it was just hard to focus. So, so I kind of foolishly decided to read two poems about teaching, one about being a teacher and one about my high school, myself and my high school teacher. So the first one is called Whatever They Want and it's, it takes place in, um, in Houston when I was teaching there. Whatever they want. Tonight, my students can ask me anything. I'll tell them the story of my life, whatever they want. Outside traffic shimmers in the Gulf haze, mosquitoes incubate in the bayou. My students laugh softly at the broad A of my accent, laugh softly at the broad A of my accent, evidence if they need it of my vulnerability a woman fallible enough to be their mother. And it's easy, I'm easy with their drawled interrogations, their curiosity, the way they listen without memory or desire every Monday while I peel another layer from the onion, the tear jerker, and the air conditioner in the classroom stirs the fine hairs on their arms. And I forget the cool protections of irony, giving them my suffering family, my appendectomy, my transcendent first kisses. What kind of teaching is this? I transport them with me to Maine, to the Ukraine. They see my great uncle's dementia, my cat's diabetes, exotic gloom, pratfalls, romantic fantasias, extravagant sleet, snow, sweet innuendos. They ask for it. They want to tell me things too. Texas stories with boots, with dead fathers and shrimp boats, with malls, with grackles, with fire ants, with ice houses, with neon, with rifles and the holy scriptures, inexhaustible reality. When I drive home singing past the palm trees and the tenebrous live oaks and the taquerias, I'm in the movies. And later when I sleep, I dream of my babies, their insatiable hungers, I give them permission to say whatever they want, as long as there's no meanness in it, as long as words taste bittersweet, as long as they're true, as long as they may. And this, this poem is, is more recent. Um, it's, it's said in, when I was in high school, it's called That Was Then. That was then. You have a Victorian sensibility, my teacher said. He said that as praise, somehow as reassurance. But I wanted to see myself an artist, not priggish, not a prude in love with a Matthew Arnold. It would be years before Midwestern boys would challenge me to defend Ginsburg, assuming as an Easterner, I not only know him, but be complicit with him, and maybe Kerouac too, 
though I'd gone nowhere, just flown to Winnetka with a lacy bridesmaid's dress for my pregnant college friend Susie's wedding. Those boys had got Sue back, where slip-covered sofas were covered also in plastic for good measure, and everyone stayed put, and for every guy a compliant dropout girl, for every girl a sachet drawer of cashmere sweater sets. It's true, I slouched around campus wearing black turtlenecks and jeans and carrying my battered Dylan Thomas, therapist would one day call my transitional object or called it last year. But Ginsburg, Kerouac, Beatniks, and Wa, which bewildered me. Maybe I am one too. One what? One what? Years before I would actually know Alan, avatar of freedoms I was still too unworldly to imagine then, before mind and how, before Kaddish, before he was oming in San Francisco, before he was being crowned Prague's Queen of the May. And here, Mr. Rinker, five feet tall, my first intellectual who loved me, wrote on my earnest handwritten proof rock paper, Rejoice that you have written this sentence. What did I know then at 17 about Prufrock or his despair? I forget the sentence I should have rejoiced over, but didn't. But never forgot the evening spread out against the sky, nor I do not think that they will sing to me. Was Mr. R saying I sang to him? two outliers after class in the amber light of a high school's classroom, a tall girl towering over a bespectacled man, thinking she was the only brooding one, miserable in her senior year at a first-class public school. What was I going to be? Dim question then, not even a question. I still too dim myself to even form the question. What could I be, just a pretty girl? Oh, please, please, not a teacher like my mother and grandmother, or like brilliant, misshapen Mr. Rinker, stuck so unfairly in the wrong place with his only body, underemployed, I'd say now glibly, but still aching for his frustration, for his bewilderment at my misery. How he did his best to console me, girl weeping by his blackboard, curled poor girl with no useful tools at her disposal. How he tried. But what could be so wrong, he asked. How could I possibly be unhappy, he said, when you're beautiful. The thing I needed to hear from him, from whose life I'd soon disappear. And now the main event. Charlotte Pence, I'm so looking forward to hearing you read from your new book. Oh, thank you both. I, I, well, thank you all for coming. Is my audio working and all fine? Great. Um, this is such a special moment for me. So for those of you who might just now be joining, um, my new book, Code, a lot of it was inspired by a friend of mine, Shira Shaman, who passed away a, a few years ago. We met when we were graduate students at Emerson College, and John Scoyles and Gail Mazur, they were our poetry professors. Um, and so I thought it would only be fitting to have something that involved um, two people who really inspired our writing um, tonight as we say hello to Code and also to reflect and, and honor to your shaman. So thank you both for being here. Um, and thank you for Brookline Booksmith. Um, and I just have to say, you know, during this time with COVID-19, y'all buy books from those independent booksellers, they, they, they need you. Um, so thank you, Bonnie, for getting everything working for us. Um, so I thought I, and I also want to say we have um, a special guest who's going to be coming on here in a little bit, David Preskin, uh, Shira's widower, and he's going to read uh, one of Shira's poems that is in code. So I'm actually going to begin with a poem tonight that is one, that's the oldest one in, in this book, and it's one that Shira helped me to write. Um, and it's called Sometimes When a Child Smiles. 
Sometimes when a child smiles, mouth open wide and greedy, even the molars exposed, it reminds me of a single afternoon when I'm passing through an orphanage in Ecuador, distancing myself with one-armed hugs and toy store gifts. I tour cafeteria-sized bedrooms guarded by bourgainvilliers scratching at windows and frowning palms standing shoulder to shoulder. Outside the girls' windows, under the garden's uncut hair, rusted a secret everyone knew and no one believed. And I know the rules. I should not repeat it. I should resist telling a story about orphans. Yet how can I ignore it when the sun angles from the west at five o'clock in May, when the lights neither new nor old, but the color of freshly squeezed lemons and it slices across a child's face at that silent moment between grin and laughter and reminds me of the girl who led me through the garden to where she found the baby. But that's too common for a story. It is this. For two months, the six-year-olds at this orphanage hid the newborn. They snuck cartons of milk under their navy cardigans and let the baby suckle off their fingertips. One girl chewed her food and spit it inside the baby's mouth like she had seen stray dogs feed their pups. They named her Caramella, a candy they wanted, and made her so content the nuns never heard her cry. Sometimes when a child smiles, I have to look away, for I know I could not do what those girls did. I could not accept a secret without fearing it, and I could not spit into a child's mouth and know this too is love. So, um, it's uh, interesting. Uh, the the books in code. I'm just flipping through my little notes here. What I want to read tonight. Sorry, uh, the the books, uh, the poems in in code. Um, they're in, they're about grief. Uh, how to live with it. How to also. Um, think about and reflect on the many different ways that the people we have loved and who have passed away can still be with us. Um, and when I was writing this book, I, I had my, my daughter who was very young, um, just a baby. Well, I guess she was like four or five actually when it really started to, to get going. And within just a couple years time, my father-in-law passed away, um, Sheer passed away and some good friends, their 16 year old daughter passed away. And it was just all, all these people, different stages of their life. And my dog died too. <laughs> and so it made me just really think, gosh, you know, I felt like words were failing me. The words were not consoling me. And so I started looking at different ways that we can preserve memory that are beyond words. And that's how I started thinking about DNA. So that's how um, DNA kind of features into this book, and I'll, and I'll get into that in just a second. Um, but what um, what really was interesting, so DNA comes in, CRISPR comes in. I have this 23-poem uh, sequence right in the middle of the book. It's all fictional. It's, it's not it's not Chira's life, but it's a, it's a fictionalized mother who's dying young of an inherited disease. Um, and what I found so fascinating is after I had written all of this, thinking about life in terms of the cell, and I thought the book was done, I'm cleaning out my winter clothes and I find Shira's thesis. And in this thesis, she's also talking about fears of dying young because her mother had recently passed away. And she also was talking about it on the cellular, cellular level. And so I just wanted to read um, one of her poems I included for with the blessing of David, which I'm so grateful. And I wanted to read one of her poems tonight. And this one's called Cell by Sheer Shaman. At first, there was just one of you, sputtering, impetuous, narcissistic, arrogant, procreating like mad in my mother's morrow, crazed as a rabid dog, afraid to mature and having an identity crisis. So, you seem to have forgotten your name, your address, mission in life. I should write it all for you on a piece of paper you could fold up 
keep in your wallet like my grandfather did at the end of his life. He had a kind of amnesia too, a confusion, and we still loved him. Con coaxed him to tell stories about the war. The summer day he met Ethel and fell head over heels. He kept your picture in his wallet too for 50 years. Not because he feared forgetting, but for the regular pleasure of remembering the golden face of his love. So that is a poem by Sheer Shaman. If you're just now joining me, I'm Charlotte reading with John Squirrels and Gail Mazur, and I'm reading from my new book, Code. So I'll read a couple of poems from this longer sequence. Um, this is going to be a poem that is from uh, DNA's point of view. It was really fun to write from DNA's point of view. Here's, here's one of DNA's poems. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally genetic code. Um, and each one of these um, sections here are different diseases that are caused by either re repeats of some nucleotides or just the, the oops of a single nucleotide. And these are all diseases that CRISPR, the new gene editing technique, would be able to possibly eradicate. That's what they're hoping right now. Um, so I'm going to read this one poem that's called the DNA speaks at their child's conception. And this is me imagining when the, when the mother figure in this, in this sequence gets pregnant, it's me imagining DNA moving into that replication and trying to find the eye color that the child is going to have. The DNA speaks at the child's conception. Twisting around ourselves, we curl at the center, copying hard, searching and weaving for our dead mother's eyes. They were hazel, yet in her greenish-gray, there was a toasty beige color that alternated with something wobbly. A plain girl on a rusted green bike. Tarnished spot on a decaying leaf. Hesitation after any compliment. Very pretty our mother might offer, and then she'd clap once, ask, what's next? As if to suggest life means never stopping. After all the searching, we find the hazel rung tangled among the bark brown, yank it free to the sound of a snap. Oh, we will see those eyes again. Memory, we know better than to depend on you. Whenever DNA comes in the book, it's always a a first person plural, we, because it's, of course, the entire lineage. All right. Okay. Um, I'm the, the other thing that fascinated me when I got Shira's thesis and I read it again after all these years is I noticed there were these echoes of her poems in my own poems in ways that were kind of startling. Um, and I'm going to read one of these poems now. Um, it, the poem is called um, A, which is the mother figure, waits for the lab results. And the first line is, my mother told me not to be like her. And when I found Shira's thesis, I'll read you a little excerpt from one of her poems. That's an epigraph here. And it is almost word for word. I failed you mother's eyes seemed to say, don't become like me. And that was Shearer's words. And I, it was just this, it's again, when you, when you're, when you understand that something's happening in ways that your cognitive brain perhaps can't understand, but something that has been almost imprinted on you. So this is, um, again, a poem from the mother's point of view as she's waiting for lab results. My, no, my, excuse me, <laughs> I start again. My mother told me not to be like her, sickly, unsatisfied. When I was 15, sneaking out, easily the screen would push away, sounding like a muffled drum. And then I'd be standing, still as a stick on the dew-lit grass, one blackened form against another blackened form. Brick block of home, stubborn boxwood, blurred maple, our edges more pronounced than our centers. 
I could almost hear the sleeping shell of my mother's body from inside the house. As Florida's sand white streets glowed around me, an obstinate grid. Move, I'd coax myself. Return, I imagined a parent saying. Divide, the street corner suggested. And soon I'd walk to yet another turn, another intersection, choice, that suggestive collar, left me to wander all night through day-blind, warm-weathered, mythic lawns of youth, whose surrounding roads were my mother's softening bones. I'm going to read one more poem, and then I'm going to turn it over to have David come on and read a poem that he wanted to read, that Shira wrote. Um, and this one is from the father figure's point of view in this sequence. Okay. And I call the father figure T. So the mother's A and the father's T, like the nucleotides, A and T always go together. T cleans out the closet. Why do we keep the baby shoes? Red Converse sneakers, white toes. They say it is a reminder of how small they were, how they depended on us. Or maybe the grass-tongued green toe is to remind me how to love when I'm stained by what I've lost. On days like this, early October sky, wide as a blue ship drifting home, I can be lulled into hoping a season of good days could exist. The shoes remind me I'm still here to care for our child, not when she's asking for something, but for when she is not. Okay. Um, if we could have David come on the screen now so that he could read a poem of his choice, that would be wonderful. Give us just a second to get all that to happen. And again, I'll just do a plug. Please buy books from Brookline Booksmith or your own independent bookstore. Hi, David. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you. Yes, yeah, nice to be here. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to thank you, Charlotte, for, for inviting me and for uh, organizing this, uh, this beautiful, beautiful event. You know, it's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm holding in my hand a copy of um, Shira's thesis from Emerson back in April 2001. Uh, it's called The Last House. And um, on it uh, are signatures of Gail and John, uh, who I've never met, uh, but I've heard a lot about uh, in my, the course of my relationship with Shira. And, uh, and then when Charlotte had told me about her, her work and the four poems that she wanted to use from The Last House, uh, I was quite honored, uh, and one of them stood out uh, for me, uh, called "Summer in Dorothy's Garden," and I think it's interesting too because John had said at the beginning he talked about Shira's presence, and um, when I this this poem talks about presence, I think, and the focus on uh, the here and now, um, and and then you, Charlotte, spoke about um, echoes of Shira's voice coming through your poems and how things are weaving together. And, uh, and I think about CRISPR technology, which is something that was um, very, very much at the forefront of Harvard science over the last five to 10 years. Um, and I had worked at Harvard's uh, tr tech transfer office. So, you know, it's like everything is coming together here uh, in amazing ways. It just reminds me of the mysteries of the universe, um, particularly when when people pass on, I'm reminded of how of how much we don't know about this existence. So this poem is called Summer in Dorothy's Garden. It slips from a branch and drops beside me, a slime green middle with no end or beginning, slithers through the startled weeds and disappears into a thicket. Dorothy assures me tree snakes are harmless. In fact, She's delighted by the unexpected visit. What do you think it means? She whispers. That snake was meant for you. 
In the story, God curses man and serpent equally, one to fight the land, the other to eat dust, both exiled indefinitely. Here, the grass is overgrown, blackberries choke the rose bush, ivy climbs the clapboards into the living room windows. My friend is 92. This summer, she lay down her trowel in deference to nature. Eden's right here, she says, picking a peony, meaning not our lives in these bodies, but this garden by the sea, where each year the earth succumbs, dies, and begins again. Mm. That's beautiful, David. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I love, love <laughs> that poem. Um, for those of you who do remember Shira, so the the thing that I that stands out for me is that smile that, that John commented on. She has just the best mm. smile, <laughs> full sure. teeth, and, and a little bit of showing of the gums. It was just so so beautiful. Um, David, you just got a nice response from someone in the chat saying beautiful reading. I see that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to just read two more poems. Um, the the next poem is um, one. It's called Morning Chicago that is talking about the, uh, gosh, um, police brutality, um, specifically in Chicago. And when I was talking to David about this event, I, we were thinking about um, a cause that, that we could perhaps um, pay some tribute to as well. And he mentioned that Cheer was in support of Black Lives Matter. So if, if you feel like that you have been meaning to donate to Black Lives Matter, this would be a wonderful time to do it. Um, and I'm gonna read you this poem um, called Morning Chicago when I lived in Illinois and lived in this teeny town in Illinois for about four years, like, gosh, was it 18,000 people? And so every morning I'd listen to the radio from Chicago to make me feel like I lived in something bigger. <laughs> and you, they would give you these stats every morning about the number of people who had died. Morning Chicago. I left the radio on too long. And so she hears the morning news. My five-year-old licking peanut butter off toast stops, holds it in midair and asks, Cops shot two kids? Will they shoot me? And I know how to answer, but I don't know how to answer. I know that because she is white and I am white and her dad is white, even our Toyota is white and our dog a beer shine blonde, the cops will not shoot her. And I am relieved and sickened by my relief. And so I say, I left the radio on too long, but that is wrong. And so I say, cops are people who make mistakes, but I know it's not just the cops, but we who leave the neighborhoods, the schools, the YMCAs, we who leave the cops alone to tend to what everyone wants to pretend doesn't exist, be it poverty, paranoia, pointlessness. And that's when her dad interrupts and says, mm, cops help us, he tells our daughter, and I shake my head. We cannot lie, although I lie all the time. And he shakes his head, suggesting she's young enough for this lie. And I think how differently parents across our untied states hold these conversations in their kitchen. Everyone chewing on a different snap, crackle, and pop as they discuss what to do when approached by a cop. And it's not just because we're white, but also that we have enough money to keep the tags up the brake lights on, the accent that hides where I'm from. My mother taught me to say, sorry, officer, I'm just running late to grandma's house. As if life is a woodsy trek, sometimes interrupted by a furry wolf whose teeth can be appeased by a smile and a please. I remove the fairy tale from my daughter and say cops, or another dispenser of violence in this world. And my husband says, stop. And I say, I will when it stops. And he says, it will never stop. 
And so we fumble for the volume as a radio mumbles, our daughter now equally confused by the two, why they killed kids and why they won't kill her. As a radio keeps up its monotone morning prattle to go down with its coffee and cream, its morning reporting, Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. Whew, okay. <laughs> so yes, um, if you feel so compelled, there's the link there where you can donate to Black Lives Matter. Okay, I'm going to end with um, one poem and then of course we can take a couple of questions. Thank you all again for coming. Thank you again to John and Gail for joining us and especially David for joining. Um, this is a poem I wanted to end with because it once again has echoes from Shira's MFA thesis. We both are using the word bone house to figure prominently in it. And I had already placed this poem first before I saw her thesis again that was titled Bone House. Bone House is um, Old English, um, in, in case you don't know, um, and the literal translation of, is it ribcage? Um, in, in Old English is Bone House. Orderly. For weeks, his button. Weeks later, his button. Left on the bureau, dust squirming into its four eyes. Like every annoyance in the end, if there ever is an end, his grew. His mother was of sound mind, not body. He couldn't arrive in time. The phone call came during a walk. His dog pulled on the dark innards of a flattened bird wet with rot. The quiet of chewing caught his attention. Returning home, Keys still needed hanging, his coat, the leash, that button, expressionless. Somewhere, his mother. Of all the ways to go, laughing is never one of them. A stranger will cover her, some nurse, some orderly. Is that what they're called, orderlies? Meanwhile, her body, her bone house, unbuttoned, buttoned. Thank you all for listening and for being a part of this tonight. Um, we can definitely take a, a few questions or um, if anybody would just like to make a comment, that's also great too. I can now take a second here to look to see what's in the chats. Um, Jennifer Weintock just said, love all the memories and the ways your language brings us to so many places. Um, so thank you, that, that's beautiful. Yeah, does, so does anyone have any questions or anything you'd like to add? Uh, this is from Brookline Booksmith. Charlotte, can you describe your process ooh, yeah, of synthesizing the science of DNA with your poetry? Did you find it difficult to balance the sometimes complicated scientific language with the voice you gave to the personified um, DNA character? Simple answer, yes. <laughs> um, it's, I, I love digging into to science. Um, I did, I guess, about three years of just research before I tried doing writing on these poems so that I could like synthesize that information so it would come out naturally. But, and there's something I had to really think about. I mean, I feel like um, poetry is, is not the best genre for um, dispensing of information, right? An, an essay is great for dispensing of information, but poetry is much more, to me, about attesting to experience. So the question is, is how to, to merge this two. At the same time, science and poetry are so similar, they both are always operating on that thin margin between what's known and unknown. Right. As a poet, if you know exactly what you're going to say in the poem, it fails. And as a scientist, if you really already know the answer, what's the point in doing that experiment? So you're always operating right on that line. So in that way, there is that similarity. Um, so for me, I, I just kept pushing on myself to learn what I could 
and then when when I came, when it came time to write, I just try to think of DNA as a character, and that's then how I can bring in um, the sense of experience rather than the way of trying to impart factual knowledge. But I did do a couple tricks, like I have a I you know I have a quiz in here, uh, which is really a, a quick um, cliff notes to understanding how DNA works. Uh, and also, you know, having that visual poem of all the nucleotides, just that can help some people understand how the replication and mutations work. So it was something I really had to um, find my way about. I mean, I, I'm not a fast, <laughs> I'm not a fast writer, <laughs> and that's fine. Um, doesn't need to be fast. So, and thanks for that question. Oh, Heather. Oh, thank you. Thank you. A&T meet. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I have these two characters, A&T, they're people, but they can also uh, be seen as nucleotides. Um, A is much sassier than T. A is already ready just to like walk away. Um, and so T is, you know, asking her, you know, what do you do? And she's like, I'm a geneticist. I study the future. And he's like, aren't we all studying the future? To which she replies, worrying is not the same as studying. <laughs> and that, I think that kind of begins their sort of relationship um, that you see in the poem. Oh, there are other questions. And if I click on ask a question. Mm -hmm. I'm looking, I'm looking. Sorry, I'm not seeing it. Okay, you can post them in the chat. Okay, that sounds good. We'll sit tight. Oh, Gail, are you wanting to, to say something? I think you're on mute. Ask a question is a picture of John. You asked what? I'm sorry. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Below oh, John scoring. Scoyles' face in is ask a question. <laughs> Did you hear me? No. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. But I someone scored a hundred on that quiz. Very good. You you definitely past your science classes. I didn't <laughs> I know I don't think I did. Um Okay, here's a question from David. Can you talk about how or if this project brought you some clarity on grief as you praise the things you love? Um, yes, yes. So, you know, David, um, one thing that, that bothered me um, so deeply when Shira passed away is that I, I wanted your children to have memories of her and, and, and definitely with the youngest son, I was worried that that would not be possible. And so the one thing that did give me a little bit of peace is thinking that her, her genes are with them. And that is another way that we hold on to, to memory. Um, there also, a, I went to look at cave art because I was thinking that's another nonverbal way that we can speak across the divide. And I was, uh, so there are a couple of poems and a little essay in here when I went to the painted caves in Northern Spain where you see the handprints, those red hands reaching out on the walls from 40,000 years ago. And, and it's just this way that I found so beautiful all of us are trying to say we've, we've been here and we have left a mark, even if it's deep down in a cave <laughs> that you have to crawl to get to. Someone still wants you to know that they've been here. So, all right. Well, I think we're getting close to the hour mark and I really am so grateful for all of your time. Um, uh oh, Gail's typing, I can hear her typing. <laughs> Maybe Gail wants to ask a final question. Um, but I just want to say again, thank you all for coming. Um, 
David, thank you for your generosity in letting us include some of Shira's work. She was just such a fantastic poet, and I, I wanted her words to be also left in this world. Oh, Bonnie, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that pesky uh, clicking. <laughs> um, but thank you all so much uh, for being here and for sharing this with us. It was really um, a beautiful event and it was it was really just lovely um, to, to be able to, to watch you all share these poems and share your love of Shira. And yeah, thank you all so much. Um, just a, a housekeeping for those watching at home. Um, this event will be, um, it has been recorded, so it will be available to watch at this link once um, the uh, broadcast has ended. Um, and you'll also be able to continue sort of chatting um, in the chat, even though the live portion will be over um, for a bit. So that'll be nice if you wanna say hello or, um, any other sort of comments, emojis, feelings, um, you can you can send those along in the chat. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate uh, everything that you've shared today. Thank you all. Thank I'll you. stick thank around you, and answer anything. Okay. Yeah. Nice to see you, Sean. Uh, nice to see you too, John. Great to see you, Gail. You? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.